Coming up next on This Week in Radio Tech, we're talking about LTE mobile data, 4G, 3G, 5G coming up, whether it's a device like an iPhone or a device like Max Connect, a data modem. Chris Tobin knows a lot about this, and he's going to be telling us how you may be able to outsmart or at least work with the cell carriers to get great data next on Twerked. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By the Ruby Console from Lavo. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerk. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by the CalRec Type R console system. Type R is a brand new, modular, expandable IP-based radio system from CalRec Audio. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from the uh, microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. I'm Kirk Harnack in the uh, Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. This is my home office. I get to sit here and do uh, work with the folks and my employer, the Telos Alliance, kind of tell people around the world about uh, good broadcast technologies and new cool stuff. So I love that. Thanks a lot to Telos for giving me, a, oh, an hour and a half or so every week to uh, get the show produced and uh, I do it with some, some Telos gear right here, too. He's cool stuff right here. Uh, I've been doing this a while. And, you know, since I do work for Telos, I have, you know, a little bit of knowledge about their products. So if you hear me talking about a technology as it applies uh, with a Telos branded product, well, that's why. And here to present, uh, uh, you know, more uh, of more technology and not necessarily Telos branded stuff, uh, my co-host, Chris Tobin. Chris, welcome into the show. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, Kirk. Thank you. And full disclosure, I am not employed by Telos, nor do I am paid in any form or shape or subsidized. So I will bash them if necessary. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm only kidding. I was, didn't mean it that way. <laughs> um, I, just, I just love, love the disclosures. Everybody's always now under the do. You know, it's like. Right, right. Like, yeah. Oh, okay. You What's his with bias? No, wait a minute. Are you working with someone? I'm here as a freelancer. Oh, okay. You're good. What, what does that mean? <laughs> It's just it's just fascinating how it's all of a sudden become an issue. It's like okay, yeah, yeah. What what's your angle? What's your axe to grind? Well, right, right. Yeah. Hey, um, uh, so we've got an interesting topic today that we're going to get into in in just a few minutes. Um, Chris and I have uh, both experienced some uh, you know interesting things with um, 4G LTE data in the last few weeks. And I thought, well, you know, maybe Chris knows something about that. Well, I asked, and oh my goodness, Chris has been, he's been studying this for years, actually. Uh, Chris Tobin actually has been studying a lot of uh, mobile data uh, characteristics, aspects, practices, and how we as engineers can maybe outsmart the average consumer and uh, get better performance than, you know, Bubba in the next seat over with his cell phone in getting mobile data. And there's, of course, re the main reason for that for mobile data in our jobs uh, is to provide uh, backhaul or audio or audio and video services for broadcasters. And that's one of the things that we do. So we can go broadcast from uh, locations other than the studio. That certainly is one really important aspect of mobile data. And since um, you know the phone companies and phone lines uh, are uh, expensive or non-existent, um, you know, it, or difficult to get uh, a DSL or a cable modem or a fiber drop and using other people's data, not always so reliable as we've certainly found out. Um, well, uh, using mobile data products can be very, very useful. It's part of your bag of tricks. And Chris is going to help us to understand some of the technologies. You know, what is 4G? What was 3G? What is 5G? What does LTE mean? What does LTE A or B? And how does knowing about these things, what can we uh, do if we run across a situation where our data is not that great? Maybe we can improve it with some certain best practices and, and techniques. And uh, as, as part of that, I'm, I'm, how about this dovetail? How about this segue? Um, one of our sponsors is uh, Max Connect, MaxConnectWireless.com. And Max Connect, they don't make this device. This is a cradle point modem. But what Max Connect does is they have set up their own data providing phone company, I guess kind of like an NVMO. Um, and what you get is uh, when you deal with Max Connect, the idea here is to provide you with reliable packet for packet data data that doesn't uh, drop packets doesn't isn't subject to the whims of a mobile network where you've got um other people at a venue all lighting up their cell phones at the same time hey halftime at a ball game comes along and all of a sudden your data speed drops to next to nothing or you know eighty thousand fans show up 
and you notice, hey, this worked great for the pregame and it may work for the postgame, but for the game itself, eh, my data is terrible. This is how you solve that problem with Max Connect Wireless. I'm going to let Chris uh, chat for a minute about this and mention a couple of technical details that uh, I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, so, Chris, give me a couple of seconds about Max, Max Connect Wireless and what it does. Well, Max Connect Wireless, the nice thing about it with the cradle point router and uh, if the SIM cards you choose, whether it be Verizon or AT&T, the approach that's taken here is it's a static IP, it's a prioritized uh, service. So, yes, I can take my smartphone in my hand and make the same data connection back to the studio, or I can take the Max Connect service and do the same thing and discover, wait a minute, how is it I'm staying better connected or less dropouts or less issues with jitter and everything else with uh, the Max Connect compared to my uh, business phone say and the reason is with max connect you're now using a tiered service so in the world of cellular tele cellular telephone it's been this way for years uh you have the public safety life safety services then you have specialized business services and those can fall under who knows anything from government to, you know what and then there's the business priority consumer and then various levels of consumer we're at the business level where we are above the consumers as far as who gets access to the cell site and data mm -hmm. resources mm -hmm. first so to speak However, you have to keep in mind that, you know, if you're in an area where public safety shows up because of an incident, whether it be, a, you know, ambulances, fire, police, there's a good chance you could get bumped off. That dates back to the days of 3G with Nextel phones when they were popular uh, and, and just the, the old PCS services. I know working here in New York City and uh, during the special events for the United Nations, uh, the uh, general council sessions, on many occasions, well, I was out with the reporters covering an event and, uh, you know, a protest begins. All of a sudden, our connectivity via cell phone suddenly became sparse, sporadic, almost sometimes non-existent. Yet six mm. blocks away, our other reporters we're working with are telling me, yeah. I, may, I call the newsroom just fine. And then I started researching why, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. So we went back to using two-way radios that we controlled. But these are the things you need to understand. You can't just assume that this ubiquitous device is always going to be available at your whim for whatever you're looking to do, because you do not control the points in between. All you control is the point in your hand. After that, you're on your own. We're going to so talk about some of the, uh, the implications of, of that and why sometimes your cell phone's got great speed, but not every packet gets through. And you mentioned something uh, just then. I, I'll take one more second to mention, and that is uh, static IP addresses. And you're right. Uh, I guess I had noticed this before, but I have an AT&T public IP address on this guy, and I've got a Verizon public IP address on this guy, depending on which uh, SIM card I fire up. So you want a fixed static public IP address so that uh, your maybe your your radio station, your TV station can get to you, uh, you know, the other direction. Uh, normally, that's not possible with a cell phone. You don't know what IP address. You may even get that carrier NAT where you've got a, a 10 dot address. So uh, you get a static public IP address with this service. MaxConnectWireless.com. It's weird spelling. Look for it in the show notes and uh, highly recommend it. And we're going to uh, our show. We're going to be talking about some of the technology that's used to make that work well, as well as other technologies. Because, you know, honestly, we've done a number of our uh, twerk shows using a uh, hotspot from a cell phone. Sometimes it's worked and sometimes we've been pretty disappointed and had to have plan B and plan C and plan D to make that work. So anyway, thanks a lot uh, to Max Connect Wireless. Great for your broadcast business, radio, uh, even TV. All right, Chris, that's our topic. And uh, in, in, we're going to break for a commercial in a couple of minutes. But let's let's kind of set the stage here for our conversation. And I'll, I'll mention just, uh, uh, I won't troubleshoot it yet, but I'll mention uh, something that happened last week that made me think we ought to do a show on this. And that's when I asked you, Chris, uh, what do you know about this topic? He said, well, actually, I've been studying this for quite a while. Last week, we were at the uh, Madison, uh, Wisconsin Broadcasters Association Broadcasters Clinic, right? In Madison, Wisconsin. And we've been there at a Marriott hotel uh, for years and years and years. And, uh, in, you know, increasingly, uh, data services have gotten better there. Uh, I've noticed that my signal strength was just fine. And in, the, in the halls uh, on the convention floor. And uh, on Tuesday last week, we did the show on Tuesday instead of Thursday. On Tuesday last week, we got ready to do This Week in Radio Tech. Uh, I did have my Max Connect wireless with me. I also had my cell phone with me. And um, wow, I noticed something pretty interesting. Data service uh, on my cell phone and on the Max Connect was, was really, really slow. The signal strength was great. I had five bars on here or four bars, whatever the highest is, had full bars on the Max Connect modem. And yet the data service just sucked. 
I even went outside and looked around. I'm not sure. I don't uh, know where the nearest tower was, maybe on the other side of the hotel. Uh, but the data service was just awful. Now, contrast that with the Wi-Fi service. We ended up doing the show over the hotel's Wi-Fi. It was the conference Wi-Fi that Wisconsin broadcasters had paid for. I don't know how much they paid for it, but I know they paid for it as a convention in the hotel. And that that Wi-Fi was pretty good. Um, uh, before the show, easily 98 megabits up and down. During our tort show, I think we suffered a little bit uh, as we went along, as more people filled up that particular hallway and were probably getting pretty heavy use on that wireless access point. And, you know, I'm scratching my head thinking, what is going wrong? Why, why, you know, I normally get, you know, on T-Mobile, pretty good data speeds. And then we also had Verizon and AT&T. We had bad or slower data, like in on the order of one to one and a half to two megabits per second on any carrier. It was, it was not enough to support doing a show. And we ended up using the Wi-Fi. So I asked Chris about this. And, and also we talked to Josh Bone. And then we kind of, we think we figured it out. We think we figured it out. And we're going to tell you what we figured out after our first uh, commercial break. Chris, do you, do you think we did a decent job of uh, troubleshooting what actually happened and, and why? Uh, yes, I think so. I think so. it's it's part of the business model that we're going to be faced with, for, you know, moving forward for the years to come when it comes to yeah. cellular technologies and, and data services and, and telephony on the wireless uh, platform. Oh, yeah. And absolutely. Then, the, then later last week, Chris, I visited you in Newark, New Jersey, doing a, a live broadcast, and you were using an interesting technique, not necessarily to solve a problem, but to avoid a problem. And we're going to talk about your technique. It probably wouldn't have worked for where I was at that particular convention hall, but I thought it was a really good idea what you did in Newark to avoid uh, a potential problem because you, you kind of knew the lay of, of the land. So that's coming up. Hey, our show this week in Radio Tech is uh, brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcasters General Store and by the Vox Pro. Hang on. We'll be right back with these good stories. <laughs> Yo, what's up? Live from NAB 2018. Hey, it's Caden. Uh, you need to check out Wheatstone and Box Pro 7.1. The upgrades are amazing. If you're a jock, if you're a talent, producer, whatever, a, a morning show, everyone knows Vox Pro. Everyone uses Vox Pro. Everyone loves Vox Pro. But now the features for this year, 2018, on 7.1 are amazing. If you're using, uh, using version 4, 5, 6, and you go to 7, this is exactly what you're missing right here. The features are a game changer. It's gonna cut down your editing time by like 80%, depending on what you use Vox Pro for. And with uh, version 7.1, introducing unlimited practic button bars right here, hotkeys right here. I'm gonna show you coming out of a song. Bad things, it's a lot of bad things that they wish and they wish and they wish and they wish. So you're coming out of your song? Yeah. Start your next song right here. It's basically an entire production room right on Vox Pro. So it's the Vox Pro we know and love with a ton more features. And now uh, this is the ultimate game changer right here, effect macros. So instead of hitting your effects button bar and going up here using your mouse for every effect, you do it right here with one click of the mouse and you're gonna cut down your editing time by about 80% without even touching this new sexy black controller. Check it out right here, Wheatstone, Vox Pro 7.1 at NAB in Vegas 2018. <laughs> Thanks a lot to Broadcast General Store for bringing us uh, a number of different advertisers and, and uh, sponsors, uh, manufacturers, one of them being Vox Pro. You can get yours at bgs.cc or call Broadcasters General Store. Hey, I just talked to them yesterday. Great people. Uh, the number is 352 622 7700. 352 622 7700. Check out Vox Pro from Broadcasters General Store. All right. So, Chris, I, I kind of teed up this problem we had last week. Uh, three different cell carriers, uh, full bars of signal, really slow data. The conference hotel Wi Fi, really good data and, you know, until the hall filled up. So, we, we and Josh Bone got on the phone and speculated as to what was going on. Turns out, Maybe I wasn't getting a signal from who I thought I was getting a signal from on any of the carriers. Why don't you fill us in on what you what we think happened? Well, I'm guessing you're you're inside the hotel, so there's no there's no uh, DAS or distributed antenna system for a, a cellular hotel network. You know what they usually right. call the uh, carrier hotels, and you yeah. were probably getting something from outside. Or they have arrangements where there is no signal permitted or they 
limit what you can access based on your connectivity and you know MAC addresses and you know carrier services. So I'm guessing the hotel probably provides services through Wi-Fi, and that's what they try to push you toward. Because I've well, been in several and, hotels I know in Vegas yeah. that do that. You walk yeah, into the building and, and suddenly I go from full full strength signal to wow, no service on the 23rd floor of a hotel in Vegas, and I'm at the window. Hmm. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's right. They, there's in the package you can get Wi-Fi. Yes, I get it. Well, what we what we figured and and uh, what was this? And is jo Josh Bone brought this up. He said, he said you're at a Marriott. Yeah, probably they have femto cells in the Marriott for the, the and and they they retransmit all the carriers, uh, but these femto cells. Are not actually retransmitting RF from the air. They're getting they're getting connectivity to each carrier via landline IP, right? Uh, just as if let's say that you lived in a home that had terrible cell coverage on your desired cell carrier. Uh, some cell carriers will give you or sell you, or there's even some third party ones you can buy a femto cell, hook it up to your home internet, and put it in your home. Now you've got a kind of a hotspot that acts like. A, a a 4G uh, a cell site, right? It's very low power. Well, the the speculation that Josh had was, oh yeah, you've got five bars of signal strength on your phone, but the hotel owns those femto cells, and they do have the ability to throttle uh, or control how fast your data delivery is. So it's not AT and T, it's not Verizon, it's not T Mobile. Those are the three carriers that I had access to right there. It's not them throttling your bandwidth or necessarily them being overloaded. Again, I had full signal strength and I didn't, I couldn't see the tower outside. So I'm, uh, you know, the, my experience has been the only way I'm getting five bars of signal is if I'm right close to a tower across the street from, you know, maybe antennas on the roof of the next building. Yeah, I'm close by. And you know, I couldn't see femto cells, but, you know, you couldn't see much up in the rafters of the rooms anyway. But I got, I believe they were there. And of course, phone calls were no problem, perfectly crystal clear. But data was limited, and our friend Josh Bone says, "Yeah, that's Marriott wanting you to buy their Wi-Fi, and uh, you, you'll get some data, but it's however much they want you to get." Now I don't know that. I'm, I'm not I'm not putting down Marriott. We're only speculating on what happened. Uh, but the point that I'm making is, no matter with my cell phone or the Max Connect wireless box, normally between these three different carriers and different methods, you can get some very reliable data. We weren't getting it at all despite five bars of signal now so does that does this scenario making sense chris absolutely absolutely okay uh that's that's been a technique for a long time and i've gone to many venues when i've done broadcasts you know if someone says hey we're going to do a broadcast from a hotel or a coliseum or a sports arena one of my questions during the site survey to the person on site with us is do you have uh, cellular contracts where you retransmit AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, or you know somebody else? And they're like, well, I don't know. Who, who can I talk to in telecom? Why? Mm. Because I'm getting some strange data results on my phone for my quick testing, and I'm pretty sure this is not because I'm in a, in a ca you know, cavern area here in the, uh, the, this, the uh, arena. And sure enough, nine times out of ten, I find out that, yes, they do have a, an arrangement. And um, the reason is you pay for the services when you're inside the building to, separate from your carrier that you have. And uh, I've had to work on arrangements where we set up outside and relay through our connections wirelessly back into the site to our OB position because uh, the cost of some of these venues and, and hotels is just just doesn't make business sense. <laughs> so, so let me ask you then about the difference between uh, what my, one might expect from a femto cell setup versus a DAS, a distributed antenna system. You've spoken pretty highly of DAS systems that exist in buildings that you uh, are working in, uh, or uh, in your, your case last week, you showed me a building across the street from where we were working, and you said that building, that facility, it was a stadium, uh, has a DAS system. Um, is a DAS necessarily or likely to be run by the cell carriers and they want to look good in that situation? It, it all depends on the arrangements. Some cell hmm. carriers will build their own, but then you'll wind up being only a carrier in the site where you have people that want other services. So what happens nowadays is a company will be hired to install the DAS and manage the access. So think of it like a, uh, a multi-user 
system. So you have a DAS system and you have multi-user ports. And well, Verizon says we want to pay our way how much to connect to this system. You know, ten thousand dollars a month. Okay, AT and T. Well, the price is set at ten. All right, so be it. Well, I'm just using a number. Let's say that is the number. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what you do. Now what that does for the two things it does. One, it puts you, the end user, closer to the cellular network. And two, it gives the cellular network operator the ability to offload or properly load balance in that particular area their data streams, their data, their traffic, their telephony, everything. Because now what happens is with a DAS, nine times out of ten, depending on location, and if it's an urban area, the uh, connectivity back to the central office or the switching office, we're going to call it, is usually through fiber. So you're not doing it over the air. So the, the stadium is getting connected back to the network through a fiber connection. So they can control what cell site turns on, turns off, how the handoffs take place. Now remember, your cell phone, no matter where you're going, it's seamless, so you don't even realize it. Your cell phone mm -hmm. is doing many things when it makes a connection to the network. Not a phone call, just simply connecting. My phone is on, it's sitting idle. It is actually connecting to a cell site. It looks and says, oh, I'm here. And now it says, by the way, what other cell sites are near me that I can hand off to that I have quality that I can be ready for? It actually looks ahead. So think of it. If you're in a stadium or a coliseum that's got a closed environment and your cell sites are all outside, everybody's going to be trying to find the nearest cell site to hand off to, and they can't because it's just physically RF signal is just not there. Yeah. So DAS systems are used. Same thing in, in uh, office buildings. Uh, many mm -hmm. office buildings now are putting in DAS systems. As a matter of fact, one of the ones I work in for our transmitter facility has a DAS system that currently supports Verizon AT&T, but it has room for two others if they choose. So uh -huh. I can go into the building anywhere on any floor and get access to my cellular network, not because it's reaching out of the building, but because the antenna is on the floor I'm on. So I'm literally 20 feet away from the cell site, if you will, the cell yeah. connectivity. <laughs> so, so talk to me so a little bit about… Cells, uh, femto cells it, work in yeah. a similar fashion, but they're more… Okay, okay. They're more designed, I think, for, um, uh, how do you put it, less organized, I guess, load balancing. I think they're, they're designed just to grab it. Here's a, here's a portion of bandwidth we'll give you, if you will, data path, and then you do what you want with it. Because I've read there's been differences, and some guys I've talked to, some network engineers I've spoke with, they try to avoid using the word phrase FM to sell on certain applications. It's like, no, that's specifically for this application. DAS is pretty much the way most systems go. I mean, DAS systems are used in UHF. Two-way communications, VHF, it's not uncommon. It's, it's not special. It's not uh, only to cellular. It just happens to be a technique. So uh, the next time you're in a building and you see little mm -hmm. round disks in the ceiling tile, uh, that's most likely the DAS system. Sometimes now they, now they make them where the tile itself is the antenna, so you can't even tell there's an antenna. <laughs> so I, I was in the New York City subway, and at, at several stops, uh, I see a little thing hanging down with yep. three little domes on them. What's that? That is the uh, DAS system called uh, Transit Wireless. It's a company that has been hired to install wireless services in the subway system. And what you're seeing is the actual antenna extension. That's the RF portion of the, the DAS. So uh, that will carry Sprint, Sprint, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile. It does Wi-Fi, the Transit Wireless Wi-Fi network they have mm. to get you into that. So you get that for free if you choose. Uh, and that's how it works. And, and that, all, all that, what you're seeing is RF to fiber. So that's the RF portion. Outside of that box, it goes back to fiber, back to a central place along parts of the system where it's basically a huge room of uh, transmitters from the cell companies that are being fed by their fiber. And that transmitted signal gets pushed out onto a fiber out to these uh, locations along the subway uh, platforms. And that box is, if you look carefully, you'll see there's two connections. One says RF, and then the other one says power. It says RF fiber and power. And that's what it is. So all that is is just a transmitter. That's just a, it's just the it's the fiber to RF they call it, but that's it. Well, the real nuts and bolts of the the network that you're connecting to is back somewhere else between station stops, uh, upstairs in a building. I, there's there was an article on it in uh, mobile mobile radio te te technology magazine about six years ago. They showed pictures of what the uh, DAS hotels I call them looked like, and it's pretty fascinating. And when I was at the World Trade Center two years ago on a tour of their installation of the DAS network. I got a chance to look at that setup, and it's, it's fascinating the way it works, from the RF to fiber, out to the site, and back to RF, and it's, it's pretty cool. And done right, if, to you, the end user, it's totally seamless. And I've used the Max Connect at two locations that have a DAS network, and it was spot on. It, was, it worked like, like you would expect. It was, it was fascinating. 
so you know, I remember a few years ago uh, when you would travel around and 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 I, I was just a maniac for testing my mobile speed. In fact, for a long time, I had uh, I had a, a, a speed mapping um, uh, app on my phone. Uh, I, I want to say p- the people at maybe it was uh, Comrex uh, were asking their users to. Um, uh, use this app and report back to them the speeds that they were getting. It was it was some in- industry company. Uh, it, it wasn't their app, but they asked you to install this this third party app, and to, just to see how how speed coverages work. Because you can have signal strength without speed, right? And and that's what I was going to mention oh, is yeah. that some years ago the cell infrastructure, that is the the speed of the connection uh, going to a given tower, may not have been very good. Uh, and a lot of towers just had a, a single T1 connection or a, a given carrier might just have a single T1 connection. It would handle you know X number of phone calls and whatever was left over could be used for for IP data. And that that sucked. That was really bad. You know, so the, the technology may have been capable of more speed. Uh, I've actually gotten pretty good speeds uh, using 3G technology. I mean, like like T1 type speeds, a meg and a half or so. Uh, but I noticed that when I started getting phones that would do 4G, I didn't always get a bump in speed. And that to me, that said, hey, the infrastructure to the tower side is not good. Well, that was years ago. And I want to say it may have been four, five, six to 10 years ago. In the last few years, um, it seems to me that the backbone speed to towers is less of an issue oh sure you'll find towers here and there where it, it's still bad uh but I, I think for the most part at least my experience has been that the the infrastructure issue is no longer an issue for cell companies getting to uh, data to the tower itself is does your uh experience reflect that too in in most locations and most times yes but i've run into Some places where I've noticed I've got full signal strength and good quality connectivity of every sort, but the data path definitely is choking. And uh, I think what's happening is the the industry is the cost of, you know, the backhaul channels, the cost is starting to increase to install more uh, physical capability for the bandwidth. The bandwidth itself is still cheap. You know, transit fees, everything else is still lower. But the cost mm-hmm. to expand that, you know, if say, say you're a cell site that's got um, a DS3, you know, you got th- 3T1 service and it's working great, but now the neighborhood has grown exponentially because of real estate popularity. Now all of a sudden you're, you're maxing out. You're, you're, you're tapping out your bandwidth. Now if you want to say to add three more T1s, just say, that means you got to do what? Bring in more fiber? Do you have to change out the equipment? What do you have to put something on the poles to get out to that site? There's there's a few things that are now starting to become an issue with the carriers to try and figure out. Well, do, is it worth doing this, or do we wait for the next technology? Which, in the case of 5G, that's what they're looking to try and do is use 5G in two ways. One, create a wireless, if you will, internet access for people over 5G that offloads some of the pressure or network congestion on the traditional setup. And also possibly places where they can, they use the 5G to be the backhaul. Well, front haul, I guess they call it too. There's a front haul and backhaul. So it, there's a few things happening moving forward. But I have been in places where where there's plenty of signal, plenty of connectivity in that sense, the signal, I should say. But then the connectivity is great for a while and slowly chokes as the, as the volume of people coming into the place oh, increases. Yeah. yeah. So. Kind of like going into your favorite... Um, uh, workout gym with your membership. Oh, a week before New Year, and it's fine. But then, you know, three days after New Year's Day, you can't get in the place because exactly. everybody's made their, their resolutions. So yeah, I I totally uh, agree with that. Uh, I, I guess traveling around, I I tend to find my IP speeds are are by and large pretty good. I. I it's almost always good enough to watch a YouTube video. And what I was, what I wanted to ask you, Chris, next is in your talking with executives and engineers from the different carriers, I know you spent some time doing that, and I've spent a little bit of time doing that too. My impression is they don't want you to, to have data trouble. They, they'd like you to believe you have plenty of data. And maybe their definition of plenty of data is enough to watch a Netflix, you know, at some reasonable bit rate or enough to watch a YouTube video. Because these days, if you can't watch a YouTube video, you're going to complain that that your carrier is not fast enough. Uh, would, would you maybe agree that for a lot of consumers, that is the mark of whether their speed is OK or not? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
I've, I've, I mean, I've had friends that do it to me. They will call me up and say, I'm having a problem. I think there's something wrong. What do you know about this? I'm like, uh, what are you trying to do? And they're telling me, oh, I'm, like, I'm not able to watch a video from this website. Okay, well, that's just one element. How about we try this? Let's try that. They're like, yeah, it works fine. No, no, the issue isn't your, your connection, your service. It's the website you're trying to connect to. <laughs> yeah. And then there's that other side. Yeah, then there's the other side that, yes, the cellular companies for business purposes, and I've talked to some folks, and you know, they will say, well, yeah, we do get feedback. Our customer relation uh, management uh, departments do get calls from people and say, my, my YouTube or my uh, Vimeo feeds are choppy or this is not working right. And it becomes an issue of, well, is the phone in a bad spot? You know, where are you yeah. located? You know, it, there's a lot of variables when it comes to wireless devices of any kind, uh, cellular sure. included. But, you know, anyone who works in the wireless industry knows all too well a lot of the, the, the physics that are involved. And I'll use the phrase Shannon's Law. And for those of you in the audience who hear that, we're like, oh, yeah, here we go. There, that's, that's it. There's the Rosetta Stone we can't break. That's, that's, the, that's the part of the, the whole theory of the wireless that gets everybody in trouble. And, and Shannon's law, for those who don't know, is the uh, maximal attainable speed, right? error-free data speed, uh, uh, which is a function of the signal's noise and the bandwidth of a signal. And that was done by Claude Shannon uh, back in the day. I think Bell Labs, they discovered this doing all their work in the wireless world from satellites and everything else. And they discovered that if you want lots of bandwidth reliably, you've got to have a signal-to-noise ratio that's really low and controlled. And uh, that's part of where cellular technology has advanced considerably. And those of us mm. who do RF work, can appreciate that when you look at the specs, but think about it. You know, your 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 mobile device, your your handheld cell phone here, has to be able to be picked up by a tower somewhere, somewhere in the neighborhood. It's not next door. It's not out the window. It could be several blocks away. You know, in such a manner that it can recover your voice and the voice of the person at the far end and keep you connected while you're walking at a normal speed of you know three or four feet a second, whatever t standard walking speed is, or maybe. In a vehicle at 20 miles an hour in city street, no, sorry, at 10 miles an hour in city street, 25 miles an hour in the, in the rural areas. Think about that. Think of the what's involved to make that happen. And there's a lot going on under the hood. And that's why when we're trying to do data and remote broadcasts and outside broadcast stuff, our needs are very unique and different from what most people use this, the network for. And that's why Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, and you call them and say, hey. I'm trying to do a broadcast from this pub or this sports arena or this business, this car dealership, and we're having issues, blah, blah, blah. Nine times out of ten, I'm pretty sure they're going to be like, what? Who are you? What, what are you trying to do? <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. understand why you're having a problem. We, According to our engineers, the signal there, uh, our services, our, our, our metrics are fine. And that's, that's where the disconnect comes, and no pun intended. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's what we're up against. So you have to learn all these different parts of the elements of cellular and know that you know, the Max Connect approach is probably one of many that people start, should start looking at because it gives you a little added buffer or, or padding to be able to get the job done in places where you have some control. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, you mentioned people calling you and say, hey, I can't watch this video or, or that video. And earlier I had referenced YouTube several times. And uh, the reason I did is YouTube um, tends to automatically make their videos available at numerous different bit rates, right? You can manually select a bit rate on most videos that I've seen here lately, uh, or you can put, have it in automatic. And the point is there, YouTube will, will do its best to feed you at the highest bit rate that your connection will support. So if you're on a mobile connection and you're only getting half a, half a megabit per second, well, they may show you a, a video at, uh, two, three, 400 kilobits per second. The quality won't be great, but on a small screen device, it'll be just fine. But what I've noticed, Chris, is a lot of times I will go to a video that is on, say, a TV station's own website. And I don't know who's hosting the video, if it's corporate or or they got some third party, but, but oftentimes, at least my eyes tell me that that video is available at one and only one bit rate. And if I don't have a solid, solid connection to that website, uh, on my on my last mile device, I'm not going to be. Wa I'm going to be watching a lot of buffering on that video screen. Uh, it seems like if I'm go looking through Facebook or Twitter, uh, or I'm just directed to some TV station website, I want to see their story. I want to watch it, and yet buffer, 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 buffer. And if I go over to YouTube on the same device in the same location, bam, I can watch anything I want. And and you're right to point out this is uh, a, could be very well be a function of that website. So I kind of use YouTube as a uh, as a metric because or as a as a reference because they've gone to a lot of trouble to make sure 
their videos are available at multi rates. Now, we're not here to talk about YouTube videos, but it is interesting to try to troubleshoot where a problem lies. And Chris, you and I know that problems are often uh, troubleshot by trying different things. Well, let's try a different device in the same place. Let's try, hey, I've had to reboot this device uh, sometimes. And after I reboot it, oh, it works great, you know, even though it's an iPhone device. Uh, so, Try different devices, different websites, different uh, 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 speed test places. You know, speedtest.net. Uh, it just seems like every, everybody, when they, every carrier or ISP, when they see a test going to that site, they go, oh, open the floodgates. Well, yeah, let's let all the speed go through. Because I often get uh, very optimistic speed results when I go to speedtest.net. And there are other tests uh, as well. I've published some papers on on different speed tests uh, and how you also want to look for uh, jitter. That's a great uh, a great measure. So maybe I'll put some of those in, in the show notes. Um, so anyway, th there's a number of tests you can do. Now, Chris, what I want to talk about after our next break here is the technique that you determined uh, would be helpful at a live video remote broadcast that you did next week. Are, are, would you share that with us when we get back from the commercial? Yeah, sure. I'm trying to remember which technique we spoke about, but I think I do. Okay, oh, the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. this is the, the, the Yagi antenna in, in the window. Ah, how much is that Yagi antenna in the window? Got it. <laughs> how much is that Yagi in the window? <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Uh, this week in Radio Tech, hey, it's, it's it's Kirk and Chris. This week we're we're dishing on um, mobile data, and we've talked about a few overview things. Chris knows way more uh, than I even know to ask him. So the second half of our show, we'll dive a little deeper into some technicalities and what you might be expecting for five uh, G as as that comes along. Our show this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at um, Calrec. We'll be right back after this message. Type R is CalRec's first native IP-based mixing console. It is fully AES67 and NMOS ISO4 and ISO5 compatible as defined by SMPTE 2110. Connectivity via CAT5e utilizing COT switches and power to the surface is supplied via standard PoE switches to minimize cabling. Its 2U core has integrated I.O., so you're instantly up and running, and it can power up to three independent mixing environments, each with their own separate DSP resources. Type R's surface is modular and expandable, consisting of three slimline panels, each of which are user-definable with layouts saved and recalled quickly between shows. It's available in four DSP packs, and as your station grows, larger packs can be added, making Type R the most flexible radio console you can buy. Find out more at calrac.com slash twerk. Thanks a lot, CalRec, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. And do check them out at calrec.com slash twerk. Hey, one of our sponsors is Angry Audio. And you know they make a lot of cool gizmos and gadgets. But Angry Audio is also now your source to get Studio Hub, the original Studio Hub high-quality uh, cables and adapters. And these are the exact same Studio Hub adapters that you have come to know and love over the years. You know, Dan Braverman, uh, who uh, invented uh, this Studio Hub brand, he really designed some high quality into the moldings, into the connections inside. You know, it's not really easy to get audio cable to go into an RJ45 jack. And Dan Braverman worked with some manufacturers to get that done perfectly every time. Have you ever had one of these fail? I never have. I never have. And that's why I love Studio Hub brand connectors. And now they're available from Angry Audio at angryaudio.com. And here's a deal I want to tell you about. By the way, I'm, I'm holding here. Uh, this is my favorite kind. This is the short kind that has the female RJ45 right there. Uh, to, this one happens to have a female XLR connectors, two of them, left and right stereo. Uh, this is the male version, male uh, left and right uh, XLRs with a female uh, RJ45. And uh, by the way, if, you, if you're new to this, the reason why they invent, uh, invented these is so much equipment nowadays, especially audio over IP gear, its audio connection scheme is an RJ45 connector. It's not carrying Ethernet data a lot of times. It's carrying analog audio or AES digital audio. And the, connect, the choice of connector in RJ45 is for higher density and for clean connections and for easy crimping of the connector onto the cable. Lots of reasons to use an RJ45 connector to carry audio. They're gold-plated too. So, you know, every time they wiggle a little bit, they're self-cleaning. Well, 
uh, what you do is you come out of the back of a piece of uh, audio over IP gear or whatever gear that has uh, that connector, the RJ45. And then, but at the other end, you've got a like a CD player, right? Uh, or some other device that has uh, XLR connectors. Well, you just plug these two together, that to the adapter, no soldering involved. Now you've got a really perfect high quality left, right audio connection or AES3 connection back to your AOIP device. And check this out. You're going to need, if, if, if you get my favorite kind, the ones with the female RJ45, you're going to need a da- uh, uh, some patch cables. Right now, right now, if you, for every one of these that you ordered, I'm, I know I'm holding up, I'm showing it, but I'm holding the, the, the traditional female RJ45 to audio connector. Every one of those you buy, you get one of these for free. It's a seven foot shielded uh, Cat5 patch cable. And it's uh, it's just perfect for carrying that audio. It'll carry your data too. If you want to use it in your data center, no problem. This is a high quality cable. Uh, it looks just like this. In fact, I pulled it out of the bin that your free one will come from. <laughs> Check them out at angryaudio.com and get your free seven foot cable, one of them for each adapter that you buy. Angryaudio.com. All right. I'm talking to Chris Tobin about um, 4G LTE data. And so many times broadcasters need to use this data. Hey, even TV stations do for video backhaul uh, from live shots. But they're using typically uh, uh, just a nest of antennas and modems, and they're bonding these together, each one carrying part of the data uh, to try to aggregate and get together uh, three, four, five, maybe even eight megabits per second for HD video. Here in, in the radio world, we just want to get a really reliable 100, 200, 300, maybe a 500 kilobits per second, but it's got to be reliable. No glitches, no clicks, uh, and and nothing like halftime when everybody opens their phone at the stadium to uh, cut down your data. You want to keep that reliable. Chris, um, you uh, you were engineering for a remote broadcast last week when I met you in Newark, New Jersey, and I, I looked at your setup and I went, huh? <laughs> Why don't you tell me what I was huh-ing about? There we go. Let me let me throw that right there. Do you see it? Do you see that triangular, gray triangular thing? That's yeah. the Yagi in the window. That's and just to the right of it are two little black paddles. That's the other wireless cellular device we had. Oopsie. Okay, so you, there we go. You had two. Yeah, you had two modems there in the window. One had the little yeah. paddles, just like like we show with the Max Connect, but the other one had a Yagi. And what were you pointing at? Well, across the street is a, uh, a sports arena, and they have a DAS mm-hmm. system inside. And as a lark, when we were doing a site survey a week earlier, I said, let me see what happens if I take this Yagi and point it t- toward the building just for fun. And using yeah. the uh, Max Connect uh, that we had, uh, the, the person I was working with purchased one. This is a, actual not my unit. This is somebody else's purchased unit. And uh, if Suncast could bring up, uh, let's see, number 001, the image that I sent you, if you could. So you see the little red box I've circled. It says signal, state connected, type LTE. This is what you yeah. get on the cradle point. This is what you see. And uh, it just happens to be an AT&T uh, service that we're using. And the signal is minus 56 dBm. It's not RSSI. It's actually a different type of signal. And um, I use that as a reference. So I connected with just the two little mag mount antennas that uh, this person purchased. They're high gain, but they're little, little guys that you can mount on a rooftop of a car or a ledge of a window that's metal. And then I took the Aggie one. So if you come back to me for the camera shot, we could, we look at this is our standard trip. In this case, our Max Connect box, right? Everyone's familiar with it. Maybe you're not. And those are the paddles that come with it. Right? Those are about three dB gain at the, the LTE frequency. So what you do is you undo one of them, and you connect an SMA to N male connector okay. to the main input, the main antenna, because there's two antennas. It's diversity. So there's an aux and a main, mm-hmm. and then you measure the signal again and sure enough what you saw was minus 56 when i did it it came back at minus 50 dbm 6 db improvement i was like wow that's twice the power that's interesting so i did it a couple of times just to make sure it wasn't just a a lock or a fluke and it seemed to be pretty stable stayed that way so we decided for the day of the event day of broadcast uh yagi toward the outside little collinear gain antenna on the mag mount on the ledge, about three feet away, so to give some distance between the RF signals, desensing the receivers. There's a lot going on there, and it worked. It worked, and they, we actually were able to get the video performance we needed. And uh, they did the, the show, with, uh, as far as I know, with no hitches. I got no complaints. Uh, last two days, I 
called and they said everything was great. They were quite happy. It worked out well. But I spent some time on the site survey calling up that sells that site uh, on the page, looking at these numbers, and said, okay, let's see, what's this, what's this? So what I started doing after that is the Cradle Point conveniently gives you, and not just Cradle Point, many of the other um, wireless routers will give you these, these stats on the modem. And if you can go to, uh, let's go to do, to do 004, let's go to number 004. That'll be the AT&T. Uh. So here is the modem data that you get back. There's other parameters that I had to clear out because they're uh, ID numbers and stuff specific to the modem, so that's a person, that's business information. So essentially you have the, uh, this is what's interesting, signal strength, 100. Ah, that's great. Then you have the uh, RSSI, minus 51. Oh, that's great. Then there's these other signals. I had situations where the other numbers, RSSI, the RS, uh, RSRP, RSRQ, were way were lower, much lower. It was annoying. That's the part about LTE that you got to pay attention to. The hmm. signal strength that you see is all of the bandwidth of that channel assignment by the cell carrier. Those of you in, who would have HD radios transmitters, right? You have the the carrier, right? You got the sidebands, the main carrier. You got the bandwidth of the OFDMs. That's the full bandwidth, the peak, the peak averaging power ratio that goes out for digital transmitter or FDM transmitters. Same is true at LTE. So when you see the RSSI and you got four bars and you can't figure out why your data rate's only half a meg, that, that has nothing to do with it. It's all because it's looking at the entire spectrum and says, oh, I got plenty of signal. But the data could be in trouble because the other parameters, which are, let's see, the RSRP, which is the average power received from the reference signal from the cell site, that's that tells the modem, okay, here's what your relative power is for all the carriers, the RFDM carriers. Then there's the RSRQ, which indicates the quality, the quality of the received signal. Now, that's the fun part. I've got some screenshots, I have to double check, where the RSRP, the average power, looked good, say minus 56, minus 57, minus 51, but then the RSRQ was way below where it should be. It's like minus 15 dB, where it should be above, you know, higher than that. And the reason for that is because those components as with any digital modulation system, is looking at the other interfering carriers around it, or RFI, or interference that can cause data corruption, noise. And these are the things you have to look at with your modem and start figuring out, okay, where am I going with this? What do I see change? And fascinating enough, the day of the broadcast, we started off at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon with pretty much nobody around. And then by about four or five o'clock, those numbers that I just told you to mention, the RS, um, RSRP, RSRQ, and uh, the RSSI started to drop. Even though I still had 100%. Still have four bars on the modem. But ah. the quality of the RF was degraded because of the other devices now coming around the area, which is basically this device. Remember, this is transmitting and receiving, even though you're not making a phone call, because it's got to right. let the cell right. site know, I'm still here. Now, any right. of us that do RF work understand blocking frequency interference and uh, near-field interference or uh, blanketing interference, the various types of RF emitters and what happens to receivers near them. So picture that. So what I did with the Yagi was separating the antennas on the modem. I purposely tried to uh, minimize the amount of uh, uh, noise floor interference, if you will. You know, if you anyone who works with spectrum analyzers or RF noise floors, your transmitter sites, you know noise floor is say 110 dBm, right? Just say. But then all of a sudden, two FM stations on your tower come back online. Uh-oh, we just went to minus 95 dBm. And now a third station came online two towers away, uh, halfway, half a mile down. Now all of a sudden you're at minus 85. That's what's happening at the LTE level, which typically operates about a minus 140 dBm, dBm, 135 dBm is the st what they operate at. So just imagine, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 cell phones selling nearby your modem, and you're trying to, we, you know, pull out data streams from a cell site that you may not be exactly at. So that's why I use the Aggie, um, and I'm testing it again in two weeks on another project to see if what I've been doing is actually working better than it should be. And, the Aggies also, you have to be careful. You got to make sure you get a Aggie that's designed for the, the channel assignments or the bands that your carrier operates in. Oh, so yeah. Really how how do you know that? <laughs> yeah. Well, the, 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 um, the carrier will tell you uh, <clears throat> which channels they, they support in particular regions. You can usually find that out. That information is mm -hmm. available online. Uh, the antenna manufacturer will tell you what, what bands it covers. Um, so I try to get antennas that are pretty much like one or two bands with what I know I'm working with. Uh, and that works out well. And I, use, I have a vector 
analyze it, I can plug into it, I sweep it and see where it's really uh, resonant at. And the antenna I have that I showed in that picture is pretty close to where it needs to be for AT&T channel, channels, bands. What are they, 2, 4, and 7, and I think 13? No, 13 is Verizon, 700 meg. So yeah, it's, um, it's close, but it works. And that, that's the trick. These are the things you have to sort of understand and realize if, if you don't, you could get caught with the pants down, so to speak. And yes, site surveys are great, and they do, they're important, but bear in mind, th this stuff will change day of, and it's not because of bad service. It's, well, part of it's actually just laws of physics, and that's what's causing it. That's why uh, several seminars I've attended and workshops I've been at for LTE design, interestingly enough, they tell you, uh, do I have it here? They actually say, the three parameters that you need to look at is not RSSI, but the actual RSRP, RSRQ, and then they, what they call SINR, which is the signal interference noise ratio. The key, yeah, key, yeah. The operative word, interference. Yeah. Most other analog systems is SNR, signal noise ratio. So the, the interference, well, you know what? Think of it like, again, we'll take HD radio. Say you're using a, a, a transmitter, it could be Gates Air, Nautel, or Alanos, or anybody, and you have a constellation waveform on your, uh, your modulation monitor of the transmitter. Now, what do you look for for constellation? Very dense, very tight looking constellation components in the quadrature signal. Well, what if you took a signal, say, close to your channel, threw it into that little constellation, and it starts to break up? What happens at the receiver? The HD, what does it do? Well, sometimes it blends, sometimes it goes out completely, or right. maybe you get halfway between and you get that stuttering or that, that weird sound or f aliasing or phasing, whatever you want to call it. You know, so everyone has a different way of describing it. That's what's happening in LTE, but we can't hear a here because it's at the data. It's on the data. What we do right. see is the jitter, latency, or the suddenly I can't connect to the website. So right. that for that particular broadcast, that was the other half of the equation I told the, the person. I said, you may want to consider offloading your demand or your bandwidth demand on site to an off site operation and just make your remote literally just one, L, one data stream out. That's it. Do not try to do anything on site other than camera, video stream, back to your video switcher somewhere else at an operation center. Let them do all the heavy lifting. And it paid off because that's because <laughs> we were only operating with just about. Three, three and a half megabits of upload bandwidth. Download was about one. By the time the night was at full bore, when you were there, I was checking it, and it was, it was decreasing quickly. But thankfully, because of the Max Connect priority, I'm pretty sure we were able to keep our connection because of that. Because one of the other things I did with the person doing the broadcast with his company, I said, take your personal cell phone, which happens to be on AT&T, and start doing some speed tests and check and see what your connectivity is. And three times he told me, I can't get a speed test to run. So I, that's, how, that's how I know that we, we, we're in the right, you know, we're doing the right thing. Wow. Wow. It, it, yeah. it, it is in, it's interesting that as broadcast engineers, um, we have some tools uh, by proxy, right, that we can use to help determine uh, what our speed is, what we should ex expect. Um, but the, the more we know, and, and I'll, I, I can put it in the show notes, you know, the, if you have an iPhone, there's a, there's a code you can put in, you can dial and hit send, and it will tell you all kinds of information about the quality of your connection to a cell site. There's apps that you can get. Um, I haven't found one I really like for the iPhone, but I know there's apps for uh, Android phones that will tell you which tower you're connected to. And I've supposed Chris, that they would uh, also uh, tell you what you know if you were connected to a DAS system in a, in a building, they would they would somehow tell you that uh, if that's part yeah, of yeah. the database that's that's getting referenced. I'm not sure what they do with a femto cell if you're hooked up to to one of those. Uh, but it, the point is that, that as engineers, we need to learn what's normal, what's not normal, what can we um, uh, get by with, and in these different figures of merit that you mentioned. RSSI, well, that's the most, that's a very basic one, but it is very basic. It shows you the RF signal strength of everything from the tower. It doesn't tell you about the quality of the data that you have. Um, if, if I could analogize, uh, analogize that to something that a lot of us as engineers are familiar with, uh, if you've ever set up a satellite dish on a digital carrier, right, which, you know, all the radio networks do that and uh, some TV, too, um, you, you may point the dish and, and get some RF, as indicated uh, on a signal strength meter that may be part of the satellite receiver. But 
what we got to tweak the dish for and the uh, the dish geometry, including uh, the polarization of the feed horn and the antenna, we got to look for the best EBNO or energy uh, per bit uh, over noise. Uh, and so that that gives us the quality. Uh, how much how much are we getting? How much are the the bits that we want to detect? How much are they above the noise? And a lot of times we're looking for at least, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 dB. The, the bigger the number, the, the, the better there. Um, and, and that's something that is, you, you can kind of tweak that with a spectrum analyzer. You can get close, but you can also look at the EBNO figure on the satellite receiver for a really fine adjustment. And if you don't have, you may have plenty, you may have a clear look at, at, the, at the satellite, but if you have something else wrong with your disk geometry or an interfering signal that's causing that thing, that energy per bit over noise to be bad, you're not going to pick up the satellite. And the same thing for the digital transmission coming into your, your cell phone or your cradle point modem, whatever it may be, you may have great RF and you may have it from three different towers, which may be transmitting signals on the same frequencies, thinking they're talking to different people. They're talking, one of them's talking to you. One of them may be talking in a, a different sector to somebody else, but you may be getting some, some bleed on that. Uh, that's that, that's what you're fighting. Have, have I kind of got that right, Chris? Yeah, that that's correct. Yeah. yeah. If, if some case you can bring up zero zero five real quick, and I'll explain. Oh, yeah. I can show you um, the numbers again. <clears throat> so you have the RSSI, which is showing, showing minus fifty six dBm. Okay, that's good. That's a good that's place good. to be. And then the RSRP, which is the resource. Uh, <clears throat> what do you call it? The average power received from the reference signal. That's minus mm -hmm. 85 dB. It's like, okay, according to the charts that are published by some of these companies that do measurements for LTE quality control, that comes in under what they call good service, good reception, you're okay. However, the other element that you have to also look at is the RSRQ. So that's mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the quality of the received signal and the quality of the, I'm going to call it like the, the, uh, the OFDM carrier quality, you know, the constellations, mm -hmm. I'll use that as a phrase. That says minus 15, okay. Well, according to the chart, RSRQ and DB, less than 11 DB is considered poor. Oh, okay. So On the RSRQ we, side. Yeah. That's correct. So according to RSRQ, the, according to the chart that I have, it says quality of the received signal in this range is typically minus 19 is bad to, to minus 3 DB is good. We're at minus 15. We're 4 DB away from bad. We're already in the yeah. region of bad. But now look yeah. at the numbers. Signal strength 100, RSSI is 56, RSRP is 85 in the range of good, but the RSRQ is in the area of almost bad. Now, understanding how this thing works is remember the digital modulation, noise, all the various elements that go into If you're doing TV, digital TV transmission, you know that. You induce any kind of noise or error into a digital stream, what happens to the receive end? Macro blocking, maybe it goes black, freezes. Audio HD radio, what happens when your antenna system is not perfectly flat or there's uh, you know, multi-path or, or um, group delay, excessive group delay in your antenna system? What happens to the HD signal, the digital? The analog, you notice, man, maybe you get a little static, maybe a little something here and there, but the digital falls apart. That's what you're experiencing here. That's why it's important to understand these parameters. So when you're doing this router uh, arrangement, doing something cellular, consider these elements, learn a little more about them. Plenty of stuff on... on um, you know, websites for this, and I, I actually went as far as picking up a paper from Texas Instruments on achieving optimum radio range. And um, in here, it talks about all kinds of things about how to interfere with co-signals, co-channel, adjacent channels, how far away, and they actually did tests at the United Nations. They have pictures of it where they did inside the building, outside the building, which brings me to another important topic with this. Nowadays, because of energy efficient um, requirements for building design and everything else that's going on, something you have to be very cognizant of, and that is low, low emission, uh, low E and wire uh, glass in buildings for oh. heating purposes and cooling and everything else. By the way, that also tends to block RF signals, and at the cellular rate, at cellular frequencies, it could be up as much as 6 dB attenuation. So, when you're standing next to the window at your office, you can't understand why your phone's not making a connection. It's not because it's a bad phone. It's because 6 dB of the, 6 dB of the signal is being lost by the time it gets through the glass. So if you're already in a weak signal area outside the building, you're going to get nothing inside the building. And I will say this because the Newark broadcast, those antennas are outside the window because when we were inside figuring, oh, we'll just put the router next to the window with the antennas, we're good. That came in at minus 75 dBm.
When I put the oh. antenna with the router attached to it outside on the window ledge holding it in my hand, it went to minus 52 dBm. Brought it back oh my in, goodness. closed the window, and, and, the, and everyone's looking at me like, is that real? I was like, that is real. Hence the Yagi and antennas restuck outside on the second site survey. So uh, these are things you got to consider, and it's seri- I mean, this is true stuff. I am not kidding you. Um, what do they call it? It's up to, yeah, it's up to five, almost five dB attenuation, maybe six, depending on the type of glass. And it's, lo- it's called low E glass. Uh, for low emission something or other. There's a name for it. And it's very common. It's it's energy efficient windows. I know for a fact that uh, when I was doing work years ago with a 5.8 gig uh, antenna in the window of the Empire State Building trying to reach a, a location on the Hudson River, uh, signal strength was considerably lower when the window was closed. When I opened the window, placed the antenna on the ledge, the power went up almost 12 dB. Talking to the building uh, engineer when they did the window changes, they are low E antenna, uh, low E windows, and sure enough, uh, at five gig, they're very resonant to attenuating. <laughs> oh. Oh. These are the things that I, I point this out because we're, we experience this stuff now. 20 years ago, low E glass was very rare. So you could yeah. be next to a window, yeah. single pane window, worked fine. Yeah. Double pane windows and beyond are what you're going to experience. And these are all the elements. Now you have to teach your, 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 your remote crews, your people going out. This goes for radio. This is TV and radio. This is not just radio, folks. This is RF. RF doesn't care who you are. It's RF. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. those of us who have <laughs> loved, lived it and worked it know that. Uh, so these are things I'm throwing out that just they're tools. That this is not the end-all solution. Read into it. Learn a little more about it. Once you start figuring out these little nuances, you'll know when you can say to somebody, yeah, don't bother doing a cellular, cellular remote from there. It's, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> or, or open the window. Or you know, in case or of the Empire State, I wonder, I wonder if you can, wonder if you can t- talk to the engineering department at the, at the building about, can we change that window to regular glass and well, our, you know, thankfully, mm. we were a tenant in the room I was in. I was able to open the window. Nowadays, you won't be able to. They, they make it as you can't, but back then you could. Mm. But I, yeah. that was my early adventures of, it's interesting. What did that just happen? And now doing work <laughs> at the World Trade Center, talking with the guys there. They said, oh, yeah, these windows, they're thermal X, Y, Z. I looked them up like, whoa, you, you're lucky you get any RF out of that thing. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, well, they, they, it's fascinating. They stop the transfer of heat and the transfer of radio waves. Thank you very much. Well, they're all pretty much in the same spectrum, <laughs> infrared and, and the electromagnetic yeah. waves. Are all Radio waves tend to be a little longer than the heat elements, but it's still it's something to know. So what does all this mean? Well, Chris is going to be back with his tip of the week for you. And if he doesn't cover what, I th- what I'm thinking of, then I'm going to have a little short tip of the week, too. So, Chris, don't, don't say what I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually going to talk about something okay. you did, which is a great idea. But you don't know what it is. Um, we're going to be right back in just a minute after this word from Lavo. Hang on. There has probably never been a better time in history to buy a new radio mixing console. Today's consoles are more sophisticated than ever, with more features and functions than you can shake a stick at, but have you noticed how complicated they are? There's a sea of knobs and switches and displays and buttons. Some of them look like you might need a pilot's license to do your show. Well, a board doesn't have to be complicated to be powerful. Just look at the new Ruby mixing surface from Lavo. The first thing you notice is how smooth and streamlined it is. Ruby has lots of cool tech, but what it doesn't have is that confusing ocean of buttons that clutter things up. Now, we all know that there are some console features that Jock only uses once in a while. So why dedicate controls to them? Ruby fixes this problem by moving those once-in-a-blue-moon controls to a touch-sensitive, customizable GUI that happily shares screen space with your other studio software, helping you fight control room clutter. Thanks to this design innovation, talent that use Ruby produce smoother shows with less errors. Controls that are used the most fall naturally to hand, while functions that rarely need adjustment are easily controlled with just a couple of clicks in the context-sensitive GUI. And Ruby has cool features you won't find on other boards, like AutoMix, an intelligent gain writing function that guarantees the perfect mix for multi-mic morning shows and call-in segments dual-mode snapshots that instantly switch the motorized faders between on-air and production modes, and enough DSP and I.O. options to make even your pro sound pals green with envy. And because quality is as important to Lavo as it is to you, every console is proudly built to fanatically precise standards at Lavo's own factory in Germany. 
If you're ready to declutter your control room, do yourself a favor. Check out the new Ruby and the other cool Lavo Radio Tech at www.lawo.com slash twerk. Thanks to Lavo for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And go to lavo.com slash twerk. They'll take you right to the radio consoles. All right. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack, Chris Tobin, wrapping up uh, this episode of uh, This Week in Radio Tech, episode 465. We've been talking about 4G LTE data and how to uh, get this kind of data. Uh, Chris, I'm sorry. I stepped away from, from the uh, desk here, and I couldn't answer your uh, text question. You go ahead and give your tip, and I've, uh, I've, I'll be ready with mine. What's your tip of the week? <laughs> well, I, I guess my tip of the week would be if you're going to do cellular type of remotes, uh, Research what you're using, uh, look at the, the carrier, find out where their cell sites are by looking around, looking for the antennas. And if, oh, yeah. if you can, if you can use a wireless device that has external SMA connectivity, then uh, go with the idea of a, a Yagi or a small external antenna and try and uh, find a way to gain, gain the system by adding more gain and making sure you place the antennas away from any possible interference. And you know, if you can, open the window and be outside. I know it sounds crazy, but that's something to consider. And if you need to open that window and be outside, Chris, I picked this tip up from you. Get you a bag of these. <laughs> See what that is? So I'm, for those of you listening, uh, I'm holding up a, a big plastic uh, spring clamp. Now, this one's black with a little orange nibs at, at the top. Ooh, that'll bite your finger. Uh, and guess what? You can get a bag of these. Here's the, here's the little ones, if you just have something lightweight to hold, okay? And there's a medium-sized one. There's a bunch of these in, in my bag, okay? And then there's the big ones, if you've got to hold a Yagi antenna. That's got a lot of spring tension on it. Look at this. Here's the bag. You can get a bag of these clamps, and this ought to be in your remote kit. Now, not the one that you just carry around, but, you know, you've... If, if you need to clamp something... Chris had his antennas. Remember those pictures of the antennas he had clamped outside? Yeah, the way he got that to sit still outside was these clamps he didn't have to drill any holes he just clamped one thing to another to another until he got it all together this is nine bucks at home depot nine bucks for all these clamps i just checked the price online eight dollars 97 cents at least in nashville tennessee handiest things in the world you need to hold something temporarily you know what actually i've got to use these at uh we've got a trunk or treat function coming up uh, at our church this uh, this weekend so uh, we had to hold up a uh, Scooby Doo banner, and this will this will this will clip it to the back of yeah, the SUV. They 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 come in handy <laughs> for a lot of things, and even cable management on a remote, they're very handy because yeah. you can attach them to a table or a table leg and put the cables through the center, and they act as little loops. And then when you're done, you just lift it and go. No cable, take cable tie cutting, nothing. It works handy. It's very very handy. And uh, yeah, for the Yagi antenna, I did use uh, a small piece of pipe attached to the Yagi and that clamp. The two clamps work just nicely, and uh, it worked out very well. And uh, I'm glad well, it did. <laughs> well, it, it was it was a great idea, and I'm I'm keeping that idea handy. And uh, speaking of handy, well, not speaking of handy, we got to go. We got a cool uh, show coming up next week, maybe even better than today's. Let me look and see what it is because, uh, um, oh, I know what it is. John Bissett is going to be our guest next week. He does the workbench. Um, column in Radio World Magazine. And John always has some really great ideas for us. So John will be along uh, next week. And then we're on the road for a couple of weeks at different functions. And then um, in November, just before Thanksgiving, uh, a week before, we our guest is going to be Brittany Williams. Brittany is the director of engineering at Wisconsin Public Radio. And they are undertaking an enormous project. And Brittany has some really cool ideas about that. So Chris, we got good stuff coming up. Can't wait to talk to you and uh, John Bissett next week. Well, I'm looking forward to that. That should be fun. All right. Hey, I want to give our thanks to uh, Suncast, our producer. Uh, Suncast, really appreciate you getting those uh, graphics up and getting the show going as usual. Thanks to Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network. Thanks to my co-host, Chris Tobin. And thanks to you for watching and listening. Tell your friends. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.